Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Shipp. I'm the Acting Chief of Staff here at the USPTO, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Clara Barton Auditorium, and a special thank you to those of, us who are, those of you who are joining us online. Um, a couple of quick programming notes. For those of you who are doing other time technical training and are in the room, please sign up in the back there to make sure that you get the proper credit. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's speaker series, a collection of special talks featuring some of the world's leading minds in invention and innovation. The speaker series was started by our director, Andre Yanku, and it has created wonderful opportunities for us to hear from some of the best and brightest people alive today. And so without further ado, Director Yanku, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cerf. Uh, I have to say, folks don't form lines to take pictures with uh, many people uh, here at the USPTO, but it was very good to see, uh, to see that. That's, uh, that says something. Um, so, uh, you know, we did start the series last year. This is our fourth installment. And um, in fact, Dr. Cerf was uh, one of the first people I called, actually. I don't know if you remember, uh, uh, but I called you directly and we spoke a little bit. He immediately said he would like to come and we had all sorts of scheduling issues, uh, but here we are better, better late than ever. Very happy to, uh, to have Dr. Cerf here. These, uh, the, you, know, you know, I say often that through the doors of the PTO walks our future. Uh, and every day, as employees at the PTO, examiners at the PTO, we get uh, to come across our desks some of the most interesting, most advanced ideas and innovations and, and created by some of the most interesting people in the world. Folks who literally change the world and the way we live. So it's so good to have an opportunity every now and then to meet face to face with these folks and hear from them directly to remind us why we do what we do every single day. And uh, Dr. Cerf is certainly one of those people. Uh, Vince Cerf is widely known as one of the fathers of the internet. We're gonna come to that in a few minutes um, and get a lot of details from him on that. But it's uh, without exaggeration to say that his work has literally changed the world in more ways than we can imagine. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Cerf began with a Bachelor's of Science at Stanford University. That's okay. Um, uh, not, not, not so bad. But then he peaked and culminated with a uh, Master's and the PhD at UCLA. And uh, that is uh, also where he met uh, uh, Bob Kahn, uh, with whom together they co-designed the elegant TCP IP protocols, which allow data to be broken into packets, addressed, transmitted, routed, and received, uh, and as they are ushered uh, through the internet and have brought us what we know today as the modern internet, internet system. Um, entire new fields of scientific inquiry and technological advancements owe their existence to Dr. Cerf. His achievements have been recognized worldwide. Let me just touch on a couple. Uh, Bill Clinton in 1987, 1997 bestowed upon Dr. Cerf the U.S. National Medal of Technology. In 2004, Dr. Cerf received the Alleman Turing Award which is considered to be the Nobel Prize, actually, for computer science. The Presidential Medal of Freedom was awarded to Dr. Cerf in 2005 by President George Bush. And near and dear to our hearts here at the PTO, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2006. Dr. Cerf says that you, quote, you don't have to be young to learn about technology. You have to feel young. So let us now hear from somebody who feels very young. Before you even ask a question, I hope everybody in the room recognizes how terrific it is to have somebody like this with all this enthusiasm running this organization. It's a real joy to have you Thank here. You. It's, uh... Thank you. It's, 
easy to easy to have the enthusiasm when when we have folks like you come through here, Dr. Surf. Uh, le let me uh, let me begin first by asking you: Is it accurate to have a moniker such as "Father of the Internet"? Well, Bob Kahn and I really did do the original design of what is today called the Internet uh, together. It was two hands on one pencil in 1973. Uh, but it was in a context, just as all other inventions are, are in a context. So there was a predecessor network called the ARPANET, which experiment, experimented on a wide area scale with packet switching. It was funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, partly to figure out whether packet switching would actually serve well in the way it was intended, and second, it was to allow sharing of computing resources among a dozen universities that ARPA was funding to do research in artificial intelligence and computer science. This is way back around 1969. So the success of the ARPANET project, which had uh, a lot of uh, participants uh, in it, led uh, very directly to uh, the idea of designing and building an internet that allowed multiple networks to be interconnected and different kinds of computers to be uh, interlinked. So. So the answer is, for the specific internet design, yes, I think it's fair to say that Bob and I are the fathers of, of that design. But I think everyone in this room must understand that any time you do something on this scale, a lot of people have to be involved, have to be committed to it. A lot of money was spent building the infrastructure uh, across a wide range of, uh, of participants, whether it was the government initially that paid for the backbones at NSF, the Department of Energy, the NASA um, team, as well as ARPA, uh, and then uh, the private sector. So uh, we may be the fathers of the internet, but, but there was a wonderful sign uh, that was put up in an operations center at MCI when I was the senior VP of engineering there. And on the sign it said, Vince Cerf may be a father of the internet, but we're the mothers who have to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, by the way, you uh, mentioned the people in this room, this room and uh, the Clara Barton Auditorium here at the PTO is to capacity, but I understand that we have more than a thousand folks watching this online as well, uh, enabled uh, by some of your technology, obviously. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit, let's go back to basics, first of all. Describe a little bit what you actually came up with, that what, what is TCP IP, why is it? that this is actually what has really created the internet vis-a-vis -vis what was there before, such as the ARPANET. So the uh, idea of packet switching, uh, which is for all practical purposes, it's electronic postcards. I mean, everything you know about a postcard applies to internet packets. Uh, they don't always make it through the network, just like postcards are not guaranteed. If you put two postcards in the post box aimed at the same destination, they don't necessarily come out in the same order you put them in. Uh, the internet does, or uh, packet switching can also uh, replicate packets. That's not a service the post office does, as far as I know. But, <laughs> but if you do retransmissions and they're routed in different directions, the recipient might actually end up with more than one copy. So it's a very, the packet switching idea uh, did not necessarily assure any kind of uh, guarantees of delivery, so that you had to add procedures in order to filter duplicates, retransmit when things were lost. In the original ARPANET design, we relied on a homogeneous collection of packet switches to deliver reliable service. So that was, the network interface was supposed to be reliable. The computers on the edges used a protocol we called the host-to-host -host protocol to uh, deliver their packets into the network, and the network would do its very best to deliver everything on the other end, and there was some end-to-end -end retransmission inside the network and filtering of duplicates and so on. So uh, that worked very well, but then uh, it worked so well that ARPA uh, said, I wonder what would happen if we decided to use computers in command and control. Uh, and the implication of that well, remember, computers are getting smaller and smaller during this period, so they start out being big uh, machines that fill rooms and they're in air-conditioned facilities and they're in fixed locations. Then they come down to departmental computers for only $100,000 instead of $6 million, and then there's workstations and desktops and laptops and so on. So they're getting smaller and smaller, and it gets to the point where in the um, 
early 1970s, it was feasible to imagine putting computers in ships at sea, in aircraft, and in mobile vehicles, and not just in fixed installations. But the ARPANET was designed out of packet switches that were connected to each other with dedicated telephone lines. And you can't use telephone lines to connect the ships together because they get all tangled up and the, the tanks run over the wires and they break and the airplanes never make it off the tarmac. So we, Bob Kahn, had, who had worked on the ARPANET as one of the architects, had gone from his company, Bolt, Baranek and Newman, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to ARPA in late 1972. And I had gone from UCLA to Stanford University also about that same time uh, to join the faculty. So he showed up in my office in the spring of 1973 and said, Vint, we have a problem. And of course, my first reaction was, what do you mean we have a problem? <laughs> and he said, well, we're serious about using computing and command and control, but now uh, we're going to have to have radio-based communication. So he had already started working on a packet satellite system, synchronous satellite with multiple ground stations, sort of like an ethernet in the sky, and these multiple ground stations would share a common packet satellite channel. And then he also had a mobile radio system. The radios were designed in, uh, by Collins Radio in, uh, in Texas, but the system was deployed in the Bay Area uh, under the control or management of SRI International. So, He's already part of the way into a multi-network environment. Oh, no, oh, by the way, a mile and a half away from my lab at, at Stanford was Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. And in May of 73, uh, Bob Metcalf and uh, uh, David Boggs had invented Ethernet. So that was a fourth packet switching technology to be lumped into this uh, possible zoo of packet switching mechanisms. So Bob says our problem is how to connect all these different networks together and make them look uniform to all of the computers that are at the edge. So that was the internet problem. And so over a period of six months, we figured out how to do that. And we designed a protocol for that we called the Transmission Control Protocol. It did all of the packet recovery and everything else that we had been relying on the network to do. And it was important to do that because there was no guarantee in the mobile radio environment that there would be reliability within the radio net or reliability with the satellite system. And an ethernet was just a dumb piece of coaxial cable. It didn't have the ability to retransmit anything, so you had to do it all at the edge. So this end-to-end -end recovery, retransmission, filtering of duplicates, and so on had to be integral to the design. So we designed TCP, uh, we wrote a paper in uh, September and that paper was published in May of 1974 in the IEEE Transactions on Communications. But by that time, by the time it was published, I was already busy doing the detailed design of TCP with a small team of uh, graduate students at Stanford. We had some people coming from Xerox Park who were part of the, um, of the um, uh, seminar. And so by the end of 1974, we had a very detailed design of the TCP protocol. And then we started implementing it in 1975, and we immediately discovered we'd made mistakes. And so we actually went through four iterations of the TCP design, and on the third iteration, somewhere around 1977, we uh, uh, realized uh, that if we really wanted to support real-time communication, that all the hard work that this transmission control protocol was doing to retransmit lost packets and to filter them out and uh, the duplicates out and so on and manage the flow control would not help us very much if the application involved real-time communication, for example, radar tracking. So you don't want to know where the missile was. You want to know where it is. And you don't care about where it was. And so if you didn't get that piece of information, don't worry about it. Just forget it. So we split the TCP into two parts, the end-to-end -end part that worried about reliable delivery and the low latency part that just got the packets there as fast as they could and too bad if some of them got lost. So IP was the unreliable uh, portion, but it had the uh, global addressing that was needed. That raises one other interesting point. Well, hold on, before you go to the yeah, other okay. interesting point, yeah. just on that question, you don't care where the missile was, you want to know where it is, so you need to know right away. That's right. <clears throat> but yeah. don't you really need to know where it is accurately? Because uh, uh, yes, it wouldn't right. help you if you know right away where it is, but that turns out to be wrong. 
So this reminds me of my early days uh, at a company called Rocketdyne. I worked on the F-1 engines for the Apollo program doing the testing to make sure they would survive until they ran out of fuel. After that, we didn't care what happened. So, <laughs> so with, to this position, that, well, I mean, you know, let's be practical. So, 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 so there was this whole question about positioning, position location and everything else. And I remember somebody writing a, a little e explanation for this. The missile knows where it is because it knows where it isn't. <laughs> and the difference between where it is and where it isn't, we call error. <laughs> so anyway, they went on, on and on and on. Um, so the honest answer is that yes, you needed to have accurate information and for that you needed timely information. And so the uh, real-time uh, aspects of IP uh, were manifest in something called user datagram protocol, which is parallel to TCP and the protocol architecture, which was hierarchical and layered. Now we had learned from the ARPANET experiment, we carried that over into the internet. So the thing that Bob and I um, contributed, in addition to the basic end-to-end -end protocols, uh, was an addressing structure that would allow all the networks, anything on any network, to refer to anything else. We didn't know exactly what applications were going to be developed, and that was important. We did not specialize the network to do any particular thing we just did it to switch packets around as, as conveniently and as quickly as it could. So we had an address structure. And the other thing which I think is worth mentioning, if you don't mind my going on a bit, Please. Uh, is that <laughs> we decided not to use an international numbering plan. And the telephone network assigned numbering plans. Uh, each country has a country code. And you know, remember, we're doing this for the Defense Department in the context of command and control. Imagine if we had decided to use country code numbering plans. So let's suppose, you know, just uh, hypothetically, that we were faced with invading country X in a couple of weeks, and we've used a country code numbering plan for our command and control system. So can you imagine going over to uh, country X and saying, uh, hi, um, I wonder if we could get some address space from you <laughs> Uh, we're planning to invade you in a couple of weeks, but our command and control system won't work unless we have addresses in your country to build the thing. That's not going to work. So we said, why don't we just have this be a topological numbering plan? Each network got its own number. And it didn't matter where the pieces of the network were, so any network could span any number of countries. The side effect of that is that the Internet doesn't actually know when its packets have crossed an international boundary. Now, all of you know about the domain name system, which came a little bit later in the early 1980s, and there is provision for country code top-level domains in the domain name system, but you also notice there are non-country codes. These are generic top-level domains like .com and .net and .org, which span uh, the entire globe. So the system is global in its design and spirit. That gives both its power, which says it doesn't matter where anything is and anywhere in the world, it should be able to communicate. It also creates problems for us because if there's some person who does a bad thing in one country that hurts somebody in another country, now we have an international problem. And today, when you see headlines, uh, you realize that this globe-girdling design also introduces some of the problems that we have to solve. So. What you came up with is truly a protocol. Uh, but I suspect many other people can come up with other protocols. And they, and they did. And they did. What is it about your protocol that you came up with, what, 40 years ago, 45 years ago now, that has withstood the test of time uh, in the face of international work here? Why didn't folks in Europe come up with their own protocol that stuck? So what, that's it. I didn't ask him to ask this question, but this is a wonderful lead-in, so thank you very much. Um, in fact, they did. They did. So first of all, around 1975 or 6, there were a set of packet switching protocols developed uh, by the consultative committee, uh, oh, I'm sorry, CCITT, which is now ITUT, X25 and X75. And the guy that led that was Larry Roberts, who had run the ARPANET project at ARPA and then left to run a company called Telenet, which spun out of Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. And I remember he's 
just beginning his commercial telenet service, and he says, what protocol should I use? So I said, why don't you use TCP IP? And he says, I can't do that. He says, why not? He says, well, those are datagrams. Says, yeah, that's the whole idea. And he says, well, I can't sell datagrams. Nobody knows what they are, but I can sell virtual circuits because I can sell them like they were real circuits and they won't know the difference. So he developed, along with several colleagues in Canada and France and the UK, the X25 protocols for packet switching, and they were standardized around 1976 or so, uh, and X75 for interconnecting X25 networks, but it was all country code uh, oriented uh, and virtual circuit oriented. Uh, so that is going on its way, it's commercialized. It was actually a very successful uh, system. Meanwhile, I'm still going along saying I need to have this other thing because I need to have the real-time capability for the, for the Defense Department. So around 1978 or so, I'm here in Washington running the program for ARPA. I am, uh, we've just done a three network demonstration in November of 77 to show that the TCP IP protocols will work across these packet radio, packet satellite, ethernet, and ARPANET systems. Um, and I would like to, uh, to freeze everything so that we can start implementing it on as many operating systems as possible. Right about 1978, our European colleagues said, uh, paraphrasing, why would we ever want to take a protocol from the U.S. Defense Department? I mean, you know, we should really develop our own. We know what we want to do. And so they developed a seven-layer open systems interconnection protocol stack, uh, which began in 1978. And for the next 15 years, there was competition between OSI and TCP IP. The difference between the two, I'm biased, remember, because, you know, my thing <laughs> worked and, and there's, it, it's, it's not that it didn't work, it's that they spent an enormous amount of time doing the detailed design and documentation. So they had stacks and stacks of documentation. They introduced a whole vocabulary uh, for talking about networking, which in fact we use today. You know, was, if, if there was anything that we should give them credit for, uh, it is at least the vocabulary for talking about networking. Um, however, we spent most of our time trying to make it work. We went through these four iterations. We implemented it across as many operating systems as we could. We put it in the field. We found our mistakes. We fixed our mistakes. Then we documented it. So uh, we sort of reversed that process. Around 1992, um, Bob Kahn and I started something called the Internet Society. There's a whole story behind why we did that. Um, but at that point, I was president of the Internet Society, and I'm still seeing these arguments about whether OSI or GCP IP are going to be the preferred protocols. Governments were choosing OSI because, after all, it was developed by an international standards organization. Why wouldn't you want to do that? These other people are just a bunch of ragtag graduate students, uh, you know, loosely held together. Um, despite, and even the U.S. government decided that OSI would be the future and the TCP IP was uh, not a blip, but it was a demonstration of feasibility. Well, at, by, t by the time 1992 rolls around, I'm beginning to think that maybe we should allow TCP IP to survive and thrive. And so in the um, exchanges about OSI versus TCP IP, I finally uh, wrote as president of the Internet Society to the head of NIST and I said, I would appreciate it very much if you would co uh, convene a blue ribbon committee to evaluate TCP IP versus OSI. Because there were a lot of people who were by now investing heavily in TCP IP implementations, wanted to use it because it worked. The academic community was fully engaged. You know, NSFNet is up and running. Our, the uh, Energy Sciences Network is up. The NASA Science Internet is up. Our European colleagues by 1992 have already made big investments. So um, I said, I really think that we should give them the opportunity to use the TCP IP protocols and be um, uh, authorized to do so. Up until that point, there was the, the government OSI profile or gossip that came out of NIST, and that was the only guidance that had been given. So the Blue, the Blue Ribbon Committee met and by 1993 concluded that these two protocols were at least equivalent and therefore it should be accepted that TCP IP could be used in lieu of OSI. And at that point, I think we turned the corner 
most of the products and services that were being built adopted uh, the uh, TCP IP. Now, the other thing that happened right in that interval is that Tim Berners-Lee came along at CERN and against many of the colleagues' opinions at CERN chose to use the internet as his base to put the hypertext transport protocols for the World Wide Web on. So he released that in December of 91, just as the Internet Society is getting started, and nobody notices. Except a couple of guys at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, and they say, wow, that's interesting. Why don't we do a graphical version of the browser? So they developed the Mosaic browser. And of course, you know, everybody knows this because it turns the internet into something that looks like a magazine with formatted text and imagery and eventually streaming audio and video and everything else. And so it's a smash hit. Everybody's downloading the Mosaic browser. And uh, a guy named Jim Clark, who had been the founder of Silicon Graphics, based on a geometry engine chip, which he had built while he was at Stanford, thanks to the metal oxide on silicon implementation system that DARPA set up for people to do VLSI design. He takes one look at this and says, boy, there's something going on there. He goes to uh, uh, Champaign-Urbana, and he takes Mark and Eric and others to start Netscape Communications in 1994. They go public in 1995. The stock goes through the roof, and the dot boom is on. The venture capital people are throwing money at anything that looks like it might have something to do with the internet until around April of 2000. And we had the dot bust. So what happened there? Well, the internet didn't go away, but a lot of companies did because the brilliant young men who were the CEOs of the companies had not taken Economics 101, which says, first of all, there's a difference between revenue and capital. Revenue is supposed to keep going. Capital is finite. When they ran out of capital, they didn't know what happened, and the company went boop, went under. Uh, the other thing that you also should learn is uh, don't spend more money than you make because your company goes out of business. So, so the end story here is that uh, after all of the uh, visibility of, of the World Wide Web, all the various other uh, companies, uh, we started to see significant investment in internet infrastructure on a global scale. Today, it's 50% penetrated around the world, so I still have a lot of work to do to get to the other 3.9 <laughs> billion people that aren't connected. But also, lots of other companies began to build on top of the web platform. So uh, it really took off in the, in the mid-1990s, and it's still going. So this is a uh, good transition. By the way, in about 10 minutes, we'll take questions from the audience. We'll have, we have three mics, and uh, I'll let you know if I get your questions ready. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, you were there at the very beginning in the 70s of the internet. First of all, I have a series of questions on that. Uh, did you envision then, or approximately at that time in the 70s, what this thing would become and how we would literally just completely take over the world and change, uh, change uh, humanity? Well, you'd have to be a megalomaniac to have imagined that in the <laughs> 1970s. I was very focused. I mean, I'm patient and persistent, but you know, I didn't. I, I, I hoped that this would do you know something useful. The, honestly, though, we did have an inkling about some of the things that have uh, have happened uh, in the ARPANET period. Electronic mail got invented. Ray Tomlinson and Bolt Baranek and Newman came up with this idea of networked electronic mail in mid 1971. And he's the guy that figured out that you wanted, if you wanted to send something to someone at a different machine, you had to say which machine it was going to, and you had to say which user it was going to. And he, he was trying to figure out, well, how do I separate those two, you know, user something? And he found that the only character that wasn't already used by the other operating systems was the at sign. So user at host was his way of saying, send this to that computer and give it to that user. So we saw email pop up in uh, mid-1971. Everybody goes crazy because it suddenly means that we can coordinate with each other without both having to be awake at the same time. Because uh, otherwise it's phone conference calls. Uh, and, and indeed, we thought that this would allow us to manage more far-flung projects because of the time zone uh, uh, accommodation. So this is computer-mediated communication. The other thing that, uh, that happened is that uh, mailing lists were very quickly created. So the first mailing list that I can remember was called Sci-Fi Lovers. 
because we were all geeks and we all argued over who was the best science fiction writer or which were the best books. So that was a distribution list. And we saw immediately that was, had social uh, character to it. We also had a mailing list called Yum Yum, which is a restaurant review list at Stanford for the you know, restaurants in the Palo Alto area, which expanded over time. So we saw the social networking uh, element of this even before internet. Uh, we certainly saw the, uh, what, it, what we think of today as Internet of Things uh, was nascent in the system. We were building sensory systems. Uh, we were using radars. We were using voice over IP. We were using video conferencing in the 19, early 1980s. So a lot of what we see today has simply become more affordable and physically smaller, therefore more portable. Uh, but we could see a lot of that coming. It, I wouldn't have predicted you know, everything that happened. But an awful lot of this was visibly nascent. And of course, as time went on, as the decades rolled along, there would be milestones when you would realize, holy moly, this is really serious. Voice over IP, for example, we're experimenting with it in the 1970s. But it starts showing up in commercial terms in 1996. It doesn't actually catch on until some, a bit later. But the companies, telephone companies, began discarding their circuit switching gear and using packet switch voice because it was cheaper. So a lot of this was hiding in there, even if I, would, I don't claim that we imagined everything that's happened on the internet. But a lot of it you could anticipate. So one more question so folks can start lining up if you'd like uh, to ask questions uh, from the audience. Um, what about the future? You have a wonderful title. I didn't mention it in the opening, but uh, your current title, you work at Google, among other things you do, and you're a, an internet evangelist. That actually, is that on your business card, by the way? It is. It says internet chief evangelist. internet evangelist. Chief internet evangelist. Not just, yeah. not just evangelist. That's fantastic. Chief evangelist. Yeah. Uh, that's a great title. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that you spend a lot of time thinking about the future. Um, what uh, in, in our dom in your domain? What what do you foresee? Where uh, where would we be? Let's say another forty years from now. Okay. So first of all, um, I didn't ask for that title, by the way. I asked for Archduke. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but Larry and Eric and Sergey reminded me that the previous Archduke was Ferdinand, and he was assassinated in 1914. <laughs> And it started World War I. So that's probably a bad title to have. Why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? Said, OK, I can do that. Uh, so I am fortunate that Google allows me uh, a great deal of latitude. Uh, one of my missions, of course, is to get more internet built. Google has contributed to that in a variety of different ways, including investment in infrastructure in Africa, for example, with fiber networks, and in India with uh, Wi-Fi's uh, along the railroad stations uh, because the fiber is running along the railroad tracks. So um, I also sit on uh, the uh, NASA Advisory Committee and have been a visiting scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since 1998. And so we have been developing new protocols for interplanetary operation of the Internet since 1998. Uh, we have those protocols. It, TCP didn't work very well between Earth and Mars because when they're the 20 minute well, one way. Well, don't you kind of need somebody minutes. else there? Uh, to well, be able to oh, we have equipment with. there. I mean, I mean, we're not building a network and hoping somebody will come. I mean, that's not. <laughs> we're, we're, we're building the network to service our manned and robotic space exploration needs to provide them with a richer communication environment than a point to point radio link, which is how we've been exploring the, uh, the solar system uh, since the 1960s. So, uh, so those protocols needed uh, some other features that TCP IP didn't have. So we've developed those. We've gone through the usual mistakes and you know, re-implementations and design. It's operating now between Earth and Mars and the International Space Station. Uh, the uh, Gateway program, which is a new orbiter around the moon, uh, which is to be launched in the mid-2020s, uh, will have those uh, protocols on board. Uh, we've offered them and, and standardized them through the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems. The protocols are freely available. There's no restrictions. There are actually no patents or anything else, actually. We, we didn't want, in this case, there to be any barrier or excuse to, uh, to not adopt them you know, for concern over a payment of some kind. So they were just released very freely and openly. So that's one thing for sure that's happening. The second thing every one of you already is, uh, is carrying around a mobile with a camera 
it's a prototype of, of an internet-enabled thing, of which there will be billions. Many of them are already in the market today. Uh, webcams, uh, security systems, uh, you know, heating, ventilation, uh, control systems, all kinds of appliances. Uh, and everyone should be very concerned about safety and security and reliability and privacy and autonomy uh, of these devices. And these are non-trivial problems to, uh, to solve. And so part of what I can foresee over the next 10, 20, 30 years is uh, a lot of um, struggle uh, and challenge to make sure this stuff actually behaves the way you expect it to. Some people are making heavy investments in machine learning and artificial intelligence. We certainly are at Google. Uh, but when you start applying those things and then relying on either the machine learning mechanisms or just the ordinary software that, that you give the device control or that, that animates the device and you hand it authority to control things, uh, there's some risk associated with that, especially if there are bugs. So I foresee a period of time when we have challenges to fix the bugs. Either they get exploited, in which case we have malware problems, uh, or privacy is invaded. Or uh, the, the headline I keep worrying about is the one that says, 100,000 webcams take over Bank of America. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's not funny anymore because 500,000 webcams did take over Dine Corporation or knocked it over in a denial of service attack a couple of years ago. So there's, there is a lot that's going to happen with programmable devices that can communicate. The internet is part of that. And our big job uh, in, in, at Google and elsewhere is to try to make sure that we do this in a way that protects everybody's interests. And that's a non-trivial challenge. On the other side, though, and on the very positive side, I'm thrilled to, uh, to see these tools coming because as Doug Engelbart, the guy that invented the mouse and many other things, said, his thought was that computers should be partners with people in order to augment our ability to think. Just like electric motors augmented our muscle power, computers can augment our brain power if we learn how to cooperate with them. So I'm all excited about what's going to happen over the next 20, 30, or 40. I just wish I could see it. I sometimes wish I was eight years old so I could see what happens in 2090. Yeah, well, the speed of innovation nowadays, 40 years, might actually happen in five or 10 or something. Faster, so faster, faster than we faster. think. All right, questions, folks, okay, anybody? You know, if you have questions, I'm going to put my little headset on so I can hear you better. All right, great. So as I so said, there are three mics. Um, very good. Ma'am. Okay. I don't, I don't know that the mics no, are that on. Mic, that mic isn't on. Try that again. How many, how many engineers does it take to turn on a microphone? <laughs> it's not on. Okay, well, we're, is, is, the, is that one on on that side? This is, this is actually... Hello? Oh, it's on. Okay. It's on. Okay, go ahead. I just wanted to say hi, Vent. Hi. Hi. Uh, actually, I have a different last name than I used to have before, but these days I am with Ernst Young, EY. A while back, and we do some uh, advisory services here at USPTO, mm. but mm -hmm. going a while back, I was part of one Gong group. Oh, my. Well, yes, we share a okay, common disaster. Okay, we share, yeah. I actually <laughs> even found, like, in TCP IP distribution list, one, one distribution, you were on it, I was on it. So we were pretty much the first company, or one of the first companies, who made TCP IP commercial. That's true. And available to everybody in the world for some fee. But anyway, so you were talking in 70s, you had no idea what would happen, the impact and so on, neither we had in 80s. There was, again, I go back to talking to some of my former colleagues and we never imagined what would happen, how, what would be the impact. So what's the next thing? I mean, is it human genome who may have this kind of impact or something else? Any opinion on your part? Well, if we go outside of communications for just a moment, uh, probably the most Im uh, important technology which has emerged is uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is allowing people to do editing of genetic sequences. <coughs> and even that, <coughs> we have to be super careful about. Uh, it turns out it doesn't work perfectly. 
then you, the, uh, modifications can be made in the, in the uh, genetic sequence where you didn't intend. And so <clears throat> anytime you see somebody making claims about uh, solving people's medical problems by editing their genes, no. yeah. you'd be very careful about that. Uh, however, I will say that we are at a, t a period of time now where our depth of understanding of biology is dramatically improving rapidly, partly because of our ability to measure things in ways we could not measure before. At this point, we have the ability to take a single cell, to select a single cell and sequence the DNA in that cell. So imagine if you have cancer, for example, uh, you can select a cell which you recognize to be cancerous because of its appearance, and you can select that DNA and, and, and uh, sequence it, and then use the information that you get to figure out how to target cells with those uh, DNA sequences. So that's one thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening, and, and it's fun from the computer science point of view, is that almost all sciences that you can think of today have a, a computational analog. So we talk about computational linguistics, we talk about computational astronomy, we talk about computational biology. So suddenly we're starting to use computers to help us do things we couldn't do before, and it gets even more exciting when you start looking at new computing technology, for example, quantum computing. And I mean, these are all current buzzwords, so nobody is, you know, will be too surprised at that. But I'm very proud of the fact that Google has invested heavily in quantum computing. We have a 72 qubit system running in uh, Santa Barbara now, which is well beyond the, uh, what is normally called the quantum supremacy limit, which is somewhere around 50 qubits. So that's becoming real, to say nothing of machine learning and, uh, and uh, neural networks and things of that sort. What about so, combining CRISPR and DNA technology with TCP IP? You can make an invention <laughs> right here. Okay, here's the thought. You scan the human for teleportation, okay? Oh, yeah. you, you scan the human, you and transmit the da DNA data instantaneously, and it gets recreated on the other side. What do you think? Put them to Mars. Well, <laughs> several things come to mind. Okay, the first I mean, one is that if you have a bad <laughs> checksum problem and you right. arrive <laughs> inverted, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, right. that's why some of the Star Trek people didn't want to get into the transporter. You know, that, hey, could I just, could I, actually, what you just said is not as silly as it sounds, not the teleportation part. But I've been working with a, with a biologist at uh, UC San Diego who sent me an email a year and a half ago saying, I found an internet inside the cell. And of course, my reaction was, okay, you know, the, the, can I come out and talk about that? <laughs> what she found is that there are layers of biological chemical communications going on between the organelles inside a cell and between cells. And so there really is a communication structure associated with biological systems. And so once we understand that, then we have an opportunity to make use of that uh, for, uh, for therapeutic purposes. So I'm all excited about the stuff that we can do now. All right, Thank sir. you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, Hi. Um, my question has to do with one of the topics you mentioned earlier about AI. I wondered what you thought the internet uh, was going to, its role other than being a transport between AI endpoints, or do you think that we, you could see it parting, being part of the integral part of AI, like having its own. So, so this, uh, this is the scenario where one day, when no one is looking, the internet suddenly becomes conscious. Uh, yes. You know, and then the scene in the movie is, it's alive! <laughs> um, Starknet. Yeah. Skynet, yeah, Skynet, that's Skynet right. right. Yeah, that's uh, so I don't think that we're likely uh, to see that exactly happen. Uh, two things are very important here. One, one of um, uh, my colleagues uh, at Google uh, has been uh, speculating about scaling of computing. Uh, he wrote, a, it's Ray Kurzweil, wrote a book called The Singularity is Near. And he was arguing that once you get up to a certain number of processors that you're getting close to the same scale as the human brain. I think that may not be the right metric because it's the connectivity of the human brain that really gives it its uh, unique character. And I'm not sure that we'll ever see that 
degree of connectivity, even in the internet today, it really tends to be very hierarchical, whereas the brain is anything but that. Uh, so I don't think that we'll see that. I think that the internet for the present is simply a wonderful road system on top of which we're able to build a wide range of applications. So when people ask for metaphors, I think of the internet as a kind of a road system that Bob and I helped to design. We said, don't build the cars longer than this or wider than this or taller than that or heavier than this and it should work on this road system. By the way, we won't tell you what kind of vehicle to design. It could have one wheel or two wheels or four wheels or 18 wheels. <coughs> we won't say anything about what buildings you put at the side of the road and what you put in them. Uh, there is enormous freedom in this architecture. So I'm sure there will be some surprises, but I honestly don't think that the artificial intelligence of the kind that you are implying will arise out of the network itself. Right. A follow-up so, question real uh, quick. Um, well, what do you think the, the residents are to adopt IPv6 or why we're so slow in moving in that this direction? Is, this is the same reason that the guy with a hole in his roof doesn't fix it. When it's raining, he doesn't want to do it because you know, it's dangerous to go up there. And when the sun is shining, it's not a problem, so why bother? Uh, a lot of people are saying, well, I still have IPv4 address space, so I don't need IPv6. What they misunderstand, by the way, most of the software in the routers, most of the software in the edge devices, your laptop, desktop, mobile, all can do IPv6. If the ISPs have not turned it on and sometimes they say, well, nobody's asking for it. And my reaction to this is nobody even should know about it. They shouldn't have, ordinary users shouldn't have to care what IPv6 is. We should just do it and get it over with. It's about 30% penetrated on the average. Uh, if ever, you can all help, by the way, if you go home and whoever your ISP carrier is, uh, ask them, when can I get my IPv6 allocation? That will help because then you'll fulfill their complaint, or satisfy their complaint that nobody was asking for it. Uh, the <laughs> they real have issue, to understand it, too. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, no, they just have to know that they have to call and ask for it. That's all, <laughs> that's all you have to know. Uh, the other problem we get is, well, I have enough IPv4 address space, so it's not a problem. The trouble is if somebody else on the other side of the world has run out of IPv4 addresses and has to use IPv6, and you want to make sure that you can use IPv6 all the way across the net. And so everybody needs to implement it. I think it, uh, the smartphones, by the way, uh, and the 5G world is all IPv6. And so I'm fairly confident that we will get to the point where the IPv4 space will be in the minority. But it's just taken a long time to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vint, I have a question here from somebody online. Okay. I said we have more than a thousand folks watching online. Okay. What are some of the obstacles in connecting the remaining 50% of the world's population, about 4 billion people? So uh, there are a number of them. The first one is cost. We have to get the cost out. Think about the way in which the internet grew. We went to the places that could afford it first. And so as you push farther and farther out to places where the internet isn't, uh, that's where you discover you need to drive cost of the communications down, you need to drive the cost of the equipment down. That's one thing. Second, you have to make it useful. I mean, it just, just having it doesn't do anything. You need local information that's useful. I mean, it, it doesn't help if you're in Caracas, for example, trying to find a plumber and all you get back from the Google search is a plumber in New York. It doesn't help. So you need local content in local languages to be useful. You need applications uh, that, that um, maybe that the government can use to help service uh, the population. Think about India for a moment where internet was not very heavily penetrated. It's getting much better now. Uh, one of the things that the Indian government did was to provide identity for some 800 million people of its population so they could be visible to the government and be able to get access to government services. So there are a bunch of variables that have to be satisfied to make the internet propagate further. At Google, we've tried to make uh, demonstration investments. So we built a, uh, an optical fiber network for the city of Kampala in Uganda. And we made it available at wholesale rates to people who could offer retail services and compete with each other for customers. And so that particular tactic worked out so well, we created a joint venture called C-squared to replicate that in other parts of Africa, just by way of example. But there's a lot of work to be done there. Policies 
have to be adopted in the governments uh, where these networks that need to be built that will encourage private sector investment, for example, and encourage competition. Uh, in some parts of the world, telecom has been a piggy bank for the government. And for a long time, termination charges were gen generated a lot of, uh, of revenue for the government. And so as the internet comes along and voice over IP is essentially free, suddenly that model doesn't work anymore. So it's a classic example of something that people here at the uh, Patent and Trademark Office are familiar with. And that is that new technologies disrupt old business models. Right. And you have to be agile to figure out what to do. And in particular, if you're in a business that's disruptible, you should be asking yourself, what could somebody else do to my business to make the business model fail? And then you learn the lesson that if somebody else is going to eat your lunch, if, or if someone is going to eat your lunch, it might as well be you. <laughs> right. Thank okay. you. Yeah. All right, ma'am. Over here. I'm Suchira. I'm also a geneticist. And one of the questions that comes to my mind as you were talking about ability to sequence single cells, CRISPR, and all of that, how do we go and design something where we are able to analyze and make use of that tremendous amount of biological data in a cost-effective and in a manner where actually people will be able to use it. So that's a really interesting question. There is, in fact, just to extend the question a little bit, there is a substantial amount of data being generated now by all of the various scientific enterprises. And one of the big questions is how do we capture the data? How do we capture the metadata so we know what it means so that the information coming from multiple sources can be combined together? In your world, you, you've done better than uh, everyone else except maybe the astronomers who have done a pretty good job of standardizing the way in which they capture data and represent it and store it and retrieve it. Uh, in the genetics world, the, uh, the three major genetic sequence banks have standardized uh, the representations and the publishing companies have insisted that people share their genetic discoveries, the sequences that they've discovered before the papers are published, which is a brilliant way of, of creating an openly available database. Uh, but you're putting your finger on uh, a problem that for many of the sciences, which is there's no common standards for representing the data. Now, imagine for a moment that you have a series of uh, sensor systems. I mean, this is, NASA has this problem. There are a bunch of specialized instruments that have been sent out uh, to gather data all around the solar system. That data is being sent back. It's being captured locally, recorded uh, in data centers. Uh, but a hundred years from now, it's not clear whether we will know what the data means. Well, I have a whole bunch of numbers here, but was this pressure, temperature, radiation level, something else? So metadata has to be captured. When was it captured? On what spacecraft? Where was it captured? All those questions have to be answered. So I'm a huge fan of standardization, of uh, data representation in order to make sure that we can uh, use that data over long periods of time. So digital preservation is part of the, part of the challenge. Thank you. I'm afraid we've uh, Are we run, running out run of time, time wow. so please feel free to come afterwards. I, uh, uh, but let me, uh, let me end with this, uh, Vint. Um, so you've been in Silicon Valley since almost, you know, or part of the Silicon Valley culture. <laughs> there, there is actually a wonderful scene in Walter Isaacson's um, Innovator's book, you make an appearance there, and uh, he describes you, I don't know if it's accurate, but he describes you as being dressed in a three-piece suit, tie, uh, yeah. briefcase in hand in the 70s in Silicon Valley, uh, perhaps a little bit out of place. Uh, a lot of things have changed in Silicon Valley. Obviously, uh, the way you dress hasn't. Because um, it's, um, it's the only suits I have. I mean, it's like... <laughs> um, but... Uh, on a final thought here, what, what do you think overall in terms of the Silicon Valley overall tech culture in the United States? Um, has it uh, changed for the better or how has it changed and what's your view uh, on the state of uh, the tech culture in the States now? So this is a very interesting question because I actually moved out of the Silicon Valley in 1976. And so I was in it for, uh, I was in, in California for 30 years. Of those, eight years were at Stanford. 
So, uh, so I was around in the early periods of Silicon Valley's evolution. Um, I think that there are a lot of peculiar phenomena that uh, have led to sil the Silicon Valley phenomena that have been harmful in some respects because the ch chasing dollars, uh, the, you know, I don't know whether any of you have, uh, have heard the, the um, expression that the worst possible economic mistake was made when somebody said the sole purpose of a company was to increase shareholder value. And, that, and then, you know, you, then you give to the CEOs maximum amounts of stock so that they will be incented to improve shareholder value which means it drives the stock up. And all kinds of behaviors uh, stem from that. And I think you're seeing more and more of the consequences of that showing up in Silicon Valley. Now, on the positive side, though, Silicon Valley is an amazing phenomenon. And it is an economic engine of extraordinary proportions. And it's very, very important to understand what the ingredients were and are that keep that engine running. That I remember Tony Blair coming out to Silicon Valley uh, while he was still prime minister, and, and he had a dozen of us sitting around the table, and he says, "How do I turn London into Silicon Valley?" And there's dead silence, <laughs> and, you know. And I'm embarrassed, and I thought, well, you know, well, the prime minister just asked a question. You know, maybe we should say something about what it was that made us. What, what did we have in common? Uh, what was it about Silicon Valley that we all shared? Steve Jobs was still alive then. He raised his hand and he said, um, well, you know, the one thing we all have in common is we've all failed at one time or another, and it didn't leave a permanent mark on our forehead. Whereas in Europe, uh, a failure, a business failure, is actually quite harmful. So the, the real answer uh, in that case was that failure was forgiven in the Silicon Valley, and that may not be true in a lot of other cultures. What will be important, though, is to find what Steve uh, Case is trying to do, for example, is to find ways of bringing serious investment into other parts of the country, but it can't be just money flowing in. We have to have education. We have to have you know, fresh, educated people in business and finance and science and technology and marketing and sales uh, to go along with that investment. Uh, and we have to have places like the Patent and Trademark Office to help people protect the intellectual property that they've created uh, to give them some time to, uh, to uh, extract the value from that. So Silicon Valley has taught us a, a bunch of lessons and it's still teaching them. And I think we need to learn from them so we don't make everything be exactly like Silicon Valley because that may not be the right answer. Well, thank you very much. Warm well, uh, hand for Dr. Sir. Doc, Vint is a great friend of the USPTO and the Department of Commerce in general, actually, and uh, you're on the board of our sister agency at NIST and so on. Uh, if you haven't visited the museum upstairs, uh, right in front there is a uh, cardboard cartoon uh, of, of uh, Vint Cerf as a superhero. Uh, he really is a uh, superhero of the innovation world and uh, an honor for you, uh, uh, for us to have you here with us Thank today. You. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.